The Augustan Age of Poetry was a period that brought back many elements used in classical forms. During this period from the late 1600s to the mid-1700s, poets used brevity and satire to craft humorous poems. They often incorporated rhyme in their witty writing. That, along with iambic pentameter, made the poems flow fluidly. Poets often wrote lengthy poems about mundane topics, juxtaposing the serious style with silly subjects. The most famous example of writing passionate poems about simple topics is Alexander Pope's work, The Rape of the Lock. This historic style poem describes a simple haircut, establishing a distinctly comical effect. Like previous poets, the Augustans frequently discuss recent events in their work. These topics include political debates and the developing ideas of science. Augustan poetry experienced a rise in popularity during a time of great global change. Augustan saw the period of enlightenment in Europe. This period was a time that spurred monstrous changes in political and scientific views. In the early 1600s, Galileo published his ideas about science. His discovery that Earth revolved around the sun sparked controversy around the world, threatening the long-held belief of the church. In 1686, the church was rocked again when Newton published his findings about gravity, inertia, and force. Many had previously believed that magic was responsible for gravity, so these ideas shocked society. Also during this time, London was hit hard with the Black Plague that wiped out 70,000 people in just one week. Disaster struck again when Japan and England were trapped in massive fires. These incidents ignited ideas of atheism in London that led to a massive sweep for atheists in the city. The world was also in the midst of expansion in the Augustan age. The Puritans founded Charlestown in what would become the United States in 1670. Over the next several decades, the colonies would form in the Americas until the last, Georgia, was founded in 1733. The human population experienced a boom, growing to around 600 million. Advances in science and hygiene led to life expectancy in Europe rising to 36 years. Neoclassic literature is writing from the 1660s to 1798. It draws ideas from the classic styles of the ancient Greeks and Romans. Its main characteristics are an emphasis on knowledge, common sense, properness, and performance in society. It is commonly known as a response to the severity of the Renaissance. The writing of this time included novels, diaries, essays, and satires. Grammar and word study became much more formalized. Richard Steele was an Irish writer and politician. He was the founder of the Tatler, which was his first journal in 1709. It appeared three times a week in print. Joseph Addison was an English essayist, poet, playwright, and politician. He and his close friend, Richard Steele, were the founders of The Spectator magazine. Samuel Johnson was an English writer, poet, essayist, moralist, literary critic, and biographer. Jonathan Swift, author of the classic Gulliver's Travel, was a major figure of English literature. The Modest Proposal is a satirical hyperbole that mocks attitude towards the poor Irish citizens. One of the most influential neoclassic writers was John Milton, author of the epic poem Paradise Lost. Much of his work reflects the political issues faced in England. Art from the Augustan period can be classified under the name of neoclassic art. The arts were inspired from ancient works and pieces that depicted classic themes, hence the name neoclassic. The neoclassic style arose from observation and reproduction of antique works and dominated European architecture, painting, sculptures, and arts. The art form spread throughout Europe, but France and England used neoclassic art the most. The movement was very important in France. It started as a rebellion against the Rocco style, which symbolized French aristocracy. After the French Revolution, France became a democracy, putting an end to the aristocratic rule. The new leaders of France wished to model the government on principles of classic Rome. Therefore, neoclassic artists created paintings and sculptures that depicted scenes from Roman history. Leading artists from this time include Jacques-Louis David and Giovanni Paolo Pan. Giovanni was a painter and architect who worked in Rome. His piece, Modern Rome and Ancient Rome, compare and contrast the styles of art that arose in this time period that pulled inspiration from ancient Rome. He was the first artist to devote his painting to the study of ruins. His paintings gained favor with French aristocracy because he created features on ruins, 
public festivals, and ceremonies. Jacques-Louis David was an influential French painter. He is also considered to be the preeminent painter of this era. John Dryden was born August 9, 1631, in Northamptonshire, England. He came from a landowning family who had connections to Parliament and the Church of England. Throughout his life, Dryden was trained in the art of rhetorical argument, which had a strong influence in his writing. He studied at Cambridge and went to London in 1637. Dryden published his first poem in 1649. Some examples of his work include The Indian Empire, All for Love, and The Hind and the Panther. In 1668, Dryden became the first official poet of England, confirmed by the letters from the king. Dryden died May 1st, 1700 in London. Alexander Pope was born May 21st, 1688. Pope was largely self-educated and taught himself French, Latin, Italian, and Greek, and was read widely, discovering Homer at the age of six. At 12, Pope composed his earliest work, Ode to Solitude. 1712 saw the first appearance of The Rape of the Lock, Pope's best known work, and the one that secured his fame. In 1713, Pope began his work on his six volume translation of Homer's Illidid, which he worked on for six years. Alexander Pope died on May 25, 1744. It wasn't until the 1930s that his reputation was revived. Pope is now considered a dominant poetic voice of his century. Domain. What dire offense from amorous causes springs? What mighty contests rise from trivial things? I sing. This verse to carol muse is due. This even Belinda may vouchsafe to view. Slight is the subject, but not so the praise, If she inspire, and he approve my lays. Say what strange motive, goddess, Could compel a well-bred lord To assault a gentle bell? Oh, say what stranger cause, Yet unexplored, could make a gentle bell Reject a lord? In tasks so bold can little men engage, And in soft bosoms dwell such mighty rage. Saul through white curtains shot a timorous ray, And oped those eyes that must eclipse the day. Now lapdogs give themselves the rousing shake, And sleepless lovers just at twelve awake. Thrice rung the bell, the slipper knocked the ground, and the pressed watch returned a silver sound. Like ancient Greek poems, Pope begins his poem by establishing a muse, John. Greek poems usually have divine figures as muses, but Pope chooses the publisher as his muse. This contrast sets up the satire that will dominate throughout the poem. More humor is created when Pope introduces the subject of his poem as amorous causes. Greeks usually include important subjects like war and love in their poems. Pope mocks society in the 1700s by having trivial things serve as his subject. Further irony is demonstrated when majestic subjects like war heroes are juxtaposed with meek human qualities. Irony, satire, and a mocking humor are all key characteristics of Augustine poetry. The second verse goes on to explain that the sun is rising and everyone is starting their day except for Belinda. She sleeps in as a mythical slump keeps her dreaming. Further mirroring Greek style, Pope structures his writing with gods and divine creatures. Alexander Pope, Winter Forest. Thy forest Windsor, and thy green retreats, at once the monarchs and the muses seats. Invite my lays, be present sylvan maids, unlock your springs, and open all your shades. John Dryden, Absalom and Achitophel. What cannot praise affect in mighty minds when flattery soothes and when ambition blinds? John Dryden, Mac Fleckno. All human things are subject to decay, and when fate summons, monarchs must obey. John Dryden, Marriage a la Mode. Why should a foolish marriage vow, which long ago was made, oblige us to each other when passion is decayed? 